Hello, welcome to the Voice of Nursing. My name is Adrian Tracy, I'm the CEO of ICG. Today we're very, very lucky. We are joined by ICG's Head of Nursing, Miriam Polk. Miriam, welcome to the Voice of Nursing. Hello, Adrian. <laughs> Obviously, I know a lot about your background and details, Maroon, but it'd be lovely for our viewers and our subscribers to maybe understand how you got into the profession and where you sort of move forward to the current role you do now. Okay, so from my perspective, um, I've always wanted to be a nurse or within the medical profession. My mum was a nurse, so that sort of started it. My mum always tells the story, I was about five or six, so we are talking a few years ago, and I got the archetypal nurse's uniform and the stethoscope, and I went round and wanted to listen to everybody's hearts. So when I was at school, I carried on thinking that I wanted to be health professional, Professional. I toyed with the idea of being a chef and then toyed with the idea of maybe being an interpreter but they said that I had to learn typing if I had to be an interpreter and I didn't want that. So I then decided to become a nurse and I joined the Royal London as a student nurse in 1983 and qualified as a nurse in 1986. So this is my 32nd year as a qualified nurse. And I was fortunate in those days because I was a salaried member of staff, so I got paid a wage for being a student nurse. And it wasn't a degree entry programme, so there were lots and lots of different flexibility. And it was a different environment to work in. So then I stayed there for a year and I worked in their HIV ward, surgical ward, general medical emergency ward. And then I moved to the hospital which was local to where I lived. Even in those days, houses down on Wapping Docks were, you know, going for 100,000 and you weren't guaranteed a view of the river. So, you know, there was no way I could afford that. So I could afford to buy the council house that I'd grown up in. So I moved back to Reading, went for an interview and was offered a job in three different wards, orthopaedics, um, general surgery and general medicine and decided oh, I hadn't done any orthopaedics so I thought I would give that a, a try. Did that and then discovered an absolute passion for older patients. I'd always been very interested in the technical side of, of nursing. I'd done um, coronary care as part of my training and my tutor always said I would end up in a very technical part of nursing. But actually I realised that wasn't what I wanted to do. So in 1989 I became the youngest appointed ward sister to the Adley Care Service and then in 1995 became the youngest appointed and first appointed matron, which caused lots of hilarity in our family because my uncle used to call me Hattie Jakes. He felt I had a resemblance in my stance and the way I dressed, the way I worked, that that probably was a, a good match. So then I stayed at the Royal Barks and had various different roles as a matron, um, as a divisional matron, as a divisional manager. I looked after the medicines division, which was huge, covered everything from um, acute medical admissions to coronary care, to elderly care, to areas of long-term condition. And then I was asked if I would become the divisional manager for the women's and children's service. So that meant looking after maternity, so working with midwives, gaining an understanding of all aspects of midwifery, but also paediatrics. And we ran community services, hospital-based services. We worked very much with the um, local authority for um, children with long-term conditions. But the area that scared me the most was the neonatal intensive care unit. I have a reputation of, I love children, and I have numerous godchildren, and I've a niece and a nephew who I absolutely adore, but they all have one thing in common. I've never held them until they are at least 28 days old, because for some reason, I am paranoid I am going to break the baby. And then I was headhunted by the director of nursing and the board at the RBH to take on a project which was called Patient Pathways. And it was about looking at how patients got through the elective processes. So once a referral was made, how did that work in line with what the patient needed? So how long did it take to get them to the right clinic for the right appointment? And I absolutely love that job because it got me to see other sides of um, healthcare. So medical records, that was an eye opener because the first thing that happened was a rat ran across the front of my foot because it was an old decrepit building. Um, but it, 
records, medical records are essential. You can't look after a patient properly if you don't know what they've, what's gone before. And I also got to work with um, people like the porters and the, and the transport team. So I've got a, a much broader understanding of some of the things that impact on the roles that nurses and other medical staff have. Because often the most important person on the ward is not the nurse, it's not the doctor, it's not the ward sister, it's the person that brings you the cup of tea in the morning. And then I went on um, at, with the trust. They asked me if I would look at their temporary staffing processes because like any organisation, and we're talking this was 2008, so there were staffing pressures then, uh, recruitment issues were occurring then, um, and we needed to have a more unified approach to how we use the staff effectively in a hospital how we moved staff, for example. So if one ward was quiet, what actions did we have to put in place to make the, the trust as safe as it possibly could? And as part of that, I also oversaw the recruitment process as well as the temporary staffing process. That started with just nurses, and by the time I left the organisation, it ran from everything from the porters, right the way through the volunteers, right the way through to the um, processes that led to the appointment of chief execs, chairmen, etc. And then I had been in the NHS, I was just over 50 then, so I'd been in the NHS a long time, and I, I'd really only worked for two organisations. I'd worked for the Royal London and I'd worked for the Royal Berkshire Hospital, and I wanted to see something different. I wanted to stretch myself. I'd done a couple of degrees while I was doing my nurse training, while I was working as a nurse, and I just wanted to, to do something that got me back to working much more directly with nurses. So that's how I ended up um, accepting the offer to come and join um, ICG Medical as its head of nursing. And no one was more surprised than me when the offer was made. And obviously you, you know, very, very career in lots of different areas. Have you sort of seen the, you know, the role of a nurse evolving over that period yeah. of time? When, when I first started my nurse training, you know, when the consultants arrived on the ward to do the ward round, every patient was pristine, the beds were made, the, there were no crumbs, you know, everything was very much geared around nurses were, were there, they were important, but doctors were as important and, you know, every, everything stopped for consultants. I worked, for example, on a ward where if the consultant saw a patient who he'd said could go home the week before but for some reason social care or whatever hadn't gone home the patient might get moved to a different part of the ward so that they weren't visible to the patient to the consultant that would never happen now um, and the other thing with nursing is that nurses have become far more um, independent practitioners. So for example when I qualified as a nurse, nurses didn't cannulate patients, they didn't, um, the, the, a lot of the technical skills that we have, you know, um, they wouldn't have had the training on how to do those. Or you had to work in a specialist area. So you know, obviously if you were an ITU nurse you had a set of skills. But as a general nurse we didn't take patients blood, we didn't do, um, can, put the cannulas in, we gave them their intravenous medications. So lots of things have evolved over time and nurses have become far more independent practitioners. Their best place to provide the care that um, patients need because it's with the nurse that the patient is with the most of the time. Because at the end of the day what patients want is to have the best possible care they can and I work from a simple mantra and it makes everybody laugh and it's been the same wherever I work. If I see care and that care wouldn't be good enough for myself or a member of my family I'm always astounded that anybody would think I would think that was acceptable for anybody else because I wouldn't. So another example of something that's really different, there is never an empty bed on a ward now, never. As soon as that patient has been identified to go home, they won't have even left, there'll be at least one more patient booked into that bed. When I qualified and when I worked as a staff nurse and in my early days as a ward sister, you might have eight or nine empty beds on a ward for 24 hours or longer. So that didn't happen. Other practical things, like everybody talks about the mandatory training that people have to do. In 1986, when I did my first set of mandatory training as a registered nurse, infection control wasn't on the list. Now it's one of the biggest things that 
you know, we have to be aware of. The way we resuscitated a patient in 1986 is different now. The ratio of heart and compressions is, is different. And so as nursing has evolved, as it's moved towards the graduate programme, people's theoretical knowledge has increased. The amount of time that a student nurse spends on a ward in their learning process is now less than it would have been when I did, because the majority of my training was done on the ward. You'd have six weeks working on the ward, and then you do two weeks in school, and then you'd do another placement, and then another period in school. Whereas now, and we were counted as pairs of hands, so we were part of the workforce. Student nurses now are not part of the workforce. They're there to learn. So it's a completely different way that things have changed. And it, like with all things that change, some of it is brilliant and, is, and really benefits the profession and therefore benefits the care of patients. Some of it maybe we've over time learned that maybe we threw the baby and the bath water out and it's now time to, to re-look at some of those elements of it. But the one thing that is has never changed is the growing demand for healthcare and the growing demand for nurses. You mentioned about healthcare assistance role changing, mm. you know, it's probably nicely bridges onto nursing associates. And maybe you could give us a bit of an idea okay, of so, you know, that role. Yeah. I know different people have come on this so far, have had different ideas yeah. on that role, but it'd be lovely to hear your thoughts on it. I think the thing is, I come from a period in nursing where we had the enrolled nurse, and, and I know that there's been a lot of discussion around whether this new role is actually just a reinvention of the enrolled nurse. Um, I don't have an idea what the enrolled nurse role So the enrolled nurse was basically, registered general nurses did three years training and could then be progressed through the promotion rank up to you know directors of nursing although they weren't they would have been chief nurses and various other titles but the enrolled nurses did a two-year training and it was more practical based and they would work only as enrolled nurses so they didn't have the opportunity to be promoted now I always give the example of an enrolled nurse that I worked with her name was Susie what that woman didn't know about surgery on a gynae ward was not worth knowing because she was there, she knew it, she had the respect of everybody that she worked with. A decision was taken when training programs were being re-evaluated that that role was no longer needed and that nurses needed to have a higher level of um, qualification. So the enrolled nurse training was, was withdrawn, but what happened was nurses were given the option who were enrolled nurses to do a conversion so they could do a one year training module to convert to become registered general nurses and a lot of enrolled nurses did that. My fundamental belief about nursing is that the way that nurses work, there are lots of things that absolutely must be done by a qualified nurse. and the most effective way to get good care is to make sure that that happens. There are other elements of our role which we legitimately can delegate. We still retain responsibility for them, but we can delegate others to do certain activities. The NMC then require us as the registered nurse to make sure that what we've delegated to somebody to do, so if you were a healthcare assistant, Adrian, I could say to you, Adrian, I would like you to go and do Mr. Bloggs's temperature pulse and blood pressure. Have you got the experience to be able to do that? You would say yes, you would go and do that and I would say right I want you to let me know if his temperature is above 38 or whatever the parameters are. You would then come and tell me. I could then check. I'm accountable for ensuring that the care that that patient receives is to a standard which is appropriate for what they need. But it doesn't mean that I physically have to go and do that task. The new role and the healthcare assistance is an unregulated profession, uh, un, un, unregulated um, field. So they're not responsible to anybody other than the employer that they work with. They will have a responsibility to maintain a registration. I'm um, not sure what, the, what it's, whether it will be called a full registration or what it will be, but they will have registrative responsibilities and there will be codes, etc., that affect them. My personal view is Anything that enables us to provide the best quality care to individuals has to be to the benefit of the individuals. If, as organisations, they're taking on these roles to detract from the number of qualified nurses that they need to try and save money, that's not an appropriate use. But the reality is that there are extreme pressures on the number of registered nurses that are available. 
for example, the largest amount, the demographic of nursing gears very much towards my age, and I don't keep it a secret, I'll be 54 in a few, few weeks' time. And in the NHS, you can retire at 55. And lots of nurses do take their retirement pension at 55. In the old days, they used to come back and do some shifts or whatever, but they don't always do that now. It's just different how people people are, but the reality is that there are not enough nurses coming through the training programs to meet the ultimate number of training qualified nurses to replace what is potentially going to leave, let alone to add to the net um, volume of nurses as we move forward with age. Mm. And you mentioned, I know some part of your role before was, uh, was international nurses. Yeah. To discuss as possible plugging yeah. the gap on any guilt support on that. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> I've worked with nurses from well, probably only about Antarctic and Antarctica are probably the only two continent areas that I haven't had worked with nurses from. Um, I've certainly recruited nurses from Europe, from Spain, uh, midwives from Portugal because midwives in Portugal train in a similar way to how they're trained in the UK. I've recruited nurses from the Philippines. I've recruited nurses from um, from India, from um, you know, various different parts of the world. And I think, you know, the reality is that we live in a multicultural society um, so being able to have nurses that come to the United Kingdom because they genuinely believe that this gives them a good career opportunity and you know when I was recruiting nurses from Spain and from Ireland it was because there was no work available for newly qualified nurses in those countries you know so to have people come in share their experiences share their learning that's brilliant but that doesn't mean that they're going to stay forever in this country. You know, so I, I think the thing about international nurses is I know that people say, you know, we're depleting the um, the workforce in those countries, and you know we can't deny that that isn't happening. But we're not the ones that are making those choices. Every nurse that makes the choice, whether it's me to move to this company or whether it's me to move to Australia, makes those choices for their personal reasons. And I think what is incumbent upon nurses that a nursing in, and profession is to ensure that we don't decry those nurses. There's a lot of discussion around Brexit and the impact that that's going to have when people are leaving. But actually, it isn't just about Brexit. It's about how do we treat people? How do we treat nurses that come from different cultures? Um, how do we... It's really hard to orientate people to culture. Um, simple things like, you know, localised language and jargon and, and, you know, things that you grow up learning and grow up knowing. You can't just learn them. They're not in a textbook. Um, so, for example, when I worked at the Royal Bucks, one of the things that we did when we brought our Spanish nurses in, yes, we, we gave them supportive English, but we gave them supportive medical English language as well. I met with a group of graduates this morning, for example, and one of the things I was saying to them was, you know, when, when you look at the language that you use and you look at the spelling of what you use, we get lots of nurses who have learned using an American language module. And one of the things that drives me demented is things like paediatrics and haematology, which are spelt without the A. But that's because that's what I grew up knowing. Yeah. And so I think for me, we can learn a huge amount from the different cultures. Um, as I said to you earlier, I come from a philosophy, very simple philosophy for me about care. People who care will give good care. Sometimes I think that as nurses, what we forget is to care about each other. We're so focused on caring about the patient that we forget to care about each other. And to have those conversations and genuinely mean those conversations, you know, it's not uncommon when nurses say, you know, I worked a 12 hour shift and I really genuinely didn't get a break and I barely got to the loo, you know, because there are times when you can't just walk away. Yeah, I think there's a, a big thing about the pressure that nurses are under in the current environment. And also, but, you know, a big thing that seems to be talked about a lot at the moment is the mental health issues. Yeah. For, for all, the, you know, especially in, in like this, is talking about nurses and the mental health and I think the pressures they're under. The yeah, and I think one of the biggest things with any nurse, so I'll, I'll use my family for example if a member of my family goes to see a doctor they are expected to in their agreement discuss with me the things that have happened so that I can help them and answer some of their questions so 
we care enough about each other as members of the family to actually want to know how they're doing. I know when my mum's feeling down. I know when a member of my team is feeling down. It's easy to not ask the question, how are you? Because maybe you haven't got the time to take the answer and the response, but actually that's not the right thing to do. And I think that nurses, sometimes we are a victim of ourselves. We will work. I have had numerous bosses over the years that have read me the right act about my hours of work. But one of the things I always say to them is, I work the way I work because it's how I can best cope. And I would be far more stressed if I was expected to stop doing something dead on nine o'clock. So you can't do that after nine o'clock. I would spend the rest of the day worrying about what, what I hadn't finished. And I think the thing about the mental health and the mental wellness and the mindfulness is, to see it out in the public arena is absolutely brilliant because actually you can be as sick from a mental health issue as you are from a physical. If you had your leg in plaster, nobody would hesitate to say, oh, how are you? How did you do that? Can I help you with anything? You know, can I, can I give you my seat, whatever. Because we don't see, necessarily look to see stress or to see anxiety, we make assumptions that it's not there. And so I think from my point of view, I've always said, I don't have a crystal ball. If you've got a problem, if you tell me about it, I can try and help. I may not be able to solve it. I may not be able to, to deal with it at that immediate time, but I stand a chance of being able to help you. And obviously with your experience looking on the wards and working in that environment yeah. for many, many years, are there any two or three tips you could see? So, you know, if we could see a fellow nurse who maybe should look out for, to maybe help them or offer yeah. that question and go, hey, how are you? And I think the thing is, um, Especially nowadays when you have a whole array of nurses that, that are working in your ward. You might have you might have borrowed a nurse from another ward because you're short. You might have an agency nurse. You might have a bank nurse. You might have somebody who's newly qualified. And it's just actually taking those few minutes just to, if you're the nurse in charge, check on the team. How are they doing? And if you're somebody that's not the nurse in charge, check on the person who's in charge and just say to them, are you okay? And if you're going off to make a cup of tea, why not see if somebody else needs a cup of tea? And it's just sometimes, I think the thing that can happen is that we forget to apply common sense. We apply um, professional practice and professional best behaviours and all the rest of it. And sometimes we're not very good at thinking about common sense. If you know that you're really busy and you know your colleague next door to you is really busy, we don't always think, right, okay, if we worked maybe slightly differently, could we help each other out a bit more? Um, and I think sometimes it's about fear. Sometimes it is about knowing that maybe you haven't got that capacity to absorb whatever might come flying at you. Um, but we often don't treat ourselves and our colleagues in the way that we would treat a patient. If you saw a patient who didn't look right, looked a bit sad, you would immediately, as a good nurse, you would immediately go and check out and find out what's going on. But we tend to almost put a blanket in front of ourselves and not do that with each other. Yeah, I think a lot of the, you know, it's come across a lot in the, you know, just in the general medical profession, doctors and nurses have to be seen, you know, sometimes they're put on that pedestal of yeah. everything's perfect. So yeah, we're not. Sometimes they're not great at going, I've done something wrong or I'm asked yeah. for help. And the thing, so they're kind of put in that position yeah. and, and it's very difficult for them to make a mistake and I think, or even go, I just need some help. And one of the biggest issues around at the moment is things like competing demands. So you might have a set of relatives that want one thing for a patient, but the patient wants something completely different and you've got to try and bridge that gap. So my clinical speciality is gerontology and I've had various conversations with relatives over the years where I've had the conversation, you can't put my mother in a home because that's my inheritance you're spending. I've also had conversations with other family members who've said, right, mum needs a home, we know she needs a home, she wants to go into the home, um, social services pay this amount of money, I, I need to top it up, I'm going to get a job because I've retired, I'm going to get another job to help. So you get all sorts of competing pressures. Well, what sort of training a nurse is given to, to, to do that? You know, because that's, you know, literally like a, a negotiation type yeah. skill. And a lot of, a lot of what happens occurs through, you get a lot of theory, but in any job, in any role, I'm sure in, in, your, in your role, there's a lot of theory and you can follow the theory, but actually you've got to learn to be able to flex that theory and to flex that knowledge. Some of the best ways to do that is by seeing others do it. So when it comes to having a difficult conversation with somebody, that's really hard if you've never seen it, never done it, 
and you know that it could be a really distressing experience. So one of the roles that I did, for example, was as um, when, I, when I was the matron for the elderly care service, we had a, a shortfall in geriatricians. Um, we had a gap between two retiring and two new ones coming. And I went on every day to the orthopedic floor and I would do an, a nursing assessment of the patients that might be suitable for rehabilitation following their surgery. But one of the things that often wouldn't have begun was the conversation about, Adrian, how do you feel about if your heart were to stop, what would you like us to do? And it's not a blunt conversation. It doesn't just, I don't just come out with that question. But it's about having that conversation with somebody about, you know, fundamentally, do you want to be resuscitated if your heart stops? Now, my family know that if my heart stops, I'm not to be resuscitated and any of my organs are to go to organ donation. And if they don't follow my instructions, I'm coming back to haunt them. But having those conversations in any aspect of life, difficult conversations have to happen in all aspects of life, even difficult conversations with your children, with your loved ones. It's about how you see that happening with others. So the role models, the, I always remember these conversations based on one that I witnessed as a student nurse between a ward manager, a junior doctor and a patient. And the ward manager was leading on it because the junior doctor was terrified of the conversation to have. And fundamentally it was about telling a patient that there were no more treatment options. There were options to keep them comfortable, but there were no more treatment options. There was no way that this patient's life was going to be saved by some miracle cure. And watching how that interaction occurred between that ward sister and that patient with myself and the doctor there as well and the patient's family gave me the courage the first time I had to do it and also gave me the courage further on down the line to allow other people with the permission of the patient to be there so that they could see it. So I think the thing about the role models, you know. I always say things end up, I, if you treat somebody how you would want to be treated yourself, you're gonna get a different reaction from them than if you treat them like they're something that you've stepped in that you didn't wish to step in. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are times when people are under pressure, um, where sometimes we forget that general civility, that general common sense. You know, and, it, and also as nurses, we have an accountability. If we identify that there are concerns or issues about the way that somebody's practicing, it's about escalating that to the appropriate people so that it can be dealt with and giving the information that's needed to enable that nurse, that individual to reflect on their practice. Reflection for nurses is one of the key tools that they have. It's our ability to break down something that's happened Think about what we could have done differently. What did we learn from that? What could we have done differently? But then the next most important stage is it sharing that. Mm -hmm. So if I make an error, make a mistake, make a decision that may be on reflection, I think maybe I could have done that differently. So for example, with a colleague this week, I, had a, um, I made a decision that had an impact for another part of um, the company. And the person wanted to understand why I'd made that decision. The right thing for me to do is to be able to explain why I made that decision, not to defend the decision I made, but if I didn't make it in a clear and rational way, why would anybody understand that? So I think it's those sorts of things that are important. And remembering that actually, for the majority of mistakes that people make, it's not a criminal offence. Here in this company, I make it really abundantly clear to everybody, to the nurses that I work with, and I work with lots and lots of nurses from different specialties. I make it clear to the other staff that work for the company. Unless you're wearing Superman pants and knickers and you haven't told me, that makes you a human being. And the very nature of being a human being means that we make mistakes. So there's not a crime in making a mistake. For me, the crime is allowing that mistake to happen again because you haven't learned from it the yes, first time. Learning, isn't it? It's, it's the learning. It's absolutely critical. And if we talk about the, you know, the nursing community at the moment, what, you know, what do you think sort of thing that current major challenges we've got in our, in our nursing community at the moment? Or oh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Four nurses. In the I think community. that um, the scope and the breadth of healthcare places huge pressure on nurses. Um, often when, you, when people talk about healthcare, the first thing that comes into their mind is hospitals. And we know that you know, the volume of patients going into hospitals has dramatically increased. We know about things like breaches on the A&E target. We know about um, the 
cancer treatment waiting times, all of those things create pressure in the hospital settings, but they create pressure in all other settings. At the same time, you've got nurses having gone from being salaried as trainees to now being bursaried, and you know the the student loan system that they now have to contend with. So we know that there are issues at the moment with the number of nurses going on to the training program because one of the things that had trained when I trained, most nurses went straight from school into training. But over years, that's changed, and a lot of people entered nursing later in life, and they entered it as a second career. If you're entering nursing as a second career and you've got a family and you've got a mortgage, a student loan does not cover all of that, that element of it. So getting the, the number of people to meet the posts that are needed to meet the training posts, you've then got as good as every training post is, you're never going to get 100% success at the end of it, so you've got an attrition rate at the end of it. As a population, of, as a community, nursing is ageing. We're also predominantly still a female um, population, so we also have the, the nurses that go off to have their families and then want to come back and work differently. I said I've worked with nurses from all over, and I know having a conversation with one nurse, for example, when she's from the Philippines. So the reason that she finds, found it difficult to have a permanent post was because to get home takes six days for her from here to the tiny little island where, where she lives, or family live, it costs an awful lot of money. So that's 12 days that just traveling to get there and get back. But the organization that she worked for would only ever give her a maximum of three weeks holiday, which wasn't enough for what she wanted to do. So I think, you know, we have to apply fle flexible approaches, but we have to be realistic as well because you can't have every single nurse on a ward who works on a term time contract because patients are still there in the evenings at weekends and on bank holidays so I think you have to nursing has to be flexible it has to recognize what is essential in its role and so yes have concerns or reservations about new roles as they're developed but actually actively engage in that development be responsible for how that role is evolved so that actually it complements what's there and doesn't detract from what's there so I think you know an aging nursing population that's not a bad thing because you know age is just a number you don't have to retire when you're 55 so I think the the scope of where nurses can work the the numbers that are in training are, are an issue and that needs to be addressed you know at the end of the day nursing is a 365 day seven days a week five days you know 24 hours a day profession most nurses don't have to do that you know we do get days off and we do have sleep time etc but I think the key thing about it is understanding that I, I if I'm going to do a degree and I'm going to end up with a student loan do I want to then go into a profession which I then got to work all these long hours and unsociable hours when I've got a family that I can't I find more difficult and I think we have to make nursing attractive but we also have to make it realistic because one of the things that leads to nurses leaving personal belief is if their expectations have been set to believe one thing and actually you deliver something different that leads to, to nurses feeling disillusioned um, and sometimes nurses just need to take a break away from what they're doing and then come back to it refreshed with a new pair of eyes. We've been changing your environment. I only mentioned mental yeah. health there. You know, t we're talking about, I think, as mentioned in the press about men a mental health nurse being in every school. Absolutely. So dealing with different problems or, or, you know, the factor of wellness yeah. or preventing before it becomes a hospital. And I think, I think the thing is as well, you know, you see health prevention programs mm. for, you know, the flu vaccination. You know, I'm a strong advocate of everybody having flu vaccine. Scene. Now, others in my profession don't agree with me on that, and that's perfect, you know, everybody has a right and a choice, but I would always advocate for a flu vaccine, because I might not be at risk of dying from flu, but I'm certainly at risk of passing it on to somebody else should I get it. And I don't like being ill. I, I, I don't want to be ill. I want to try and do everything I can to prevent that. But I think the thing is, with mental health conditions, where are the preventative programs that enable you to pick up early the signs and symptoms? And as you say, my niece has just done her O-levels. I do not know how my niece got through the pressure that she was under for, as a 16, well, she's just 16, how she got through that pressure. You know, when I did my O-levels many, many years ago, I did two exam papers at most for each subject. I did, I actually did two extra subjects 
than, than was expected. My niece was having four papers for each exam in some cases. They went on for an extraordinary amount of time. Huge pressure on them to, to do well because not just for themselves but how it reflects on the school and what it means for the future going forward. Now she's very lucky. She comes from a family that is immensely supportive. I worry about those that don't come from that and we set people up to fail in life. That there's I, I'm, I'm a keen sports fan, keen football fan, and there are some games where there has to be a winner and you can't be satisfied with a draw. The FA Cup final can't end on a draw, it has to end with a winner. But sometimes it feels like from a society point of view, our expectation is we everybody has to be treated equally and so you know there will always, everybody will be equal. But life isn't always like that so sometimes I think we we need to think about how we recognize and prepare people for the difficult times recognizing when kids are under pressure the thought that children can't think of anything else other than the only way to to do something is to end their life is dreadful it's and we know about it more because it's visible more to us now it doesn't mean it didn't happen years ago but it's visible through things like social media um, you know through the discussions and that that go on bullying existed when I was a child it's just a different format now from a society point of view and from a nursing point of view general nurses are not mental health nurses but they have an understanding of mental health illness it's part of their training as a general nurse you get training in lots of different areas I'm not a midwife but I had to spend four weeks in midwifery learning about babies development and and ladies going into labor and giving birth and you know all of those types of, of elements what, what, what's nursing look like in three five ten years time? right firstly i don't need a crystal ball to know that there will always be nurses and we may do things with more technology because let's be honest you know when i think of some of the things that are happening now they were like science fiction when i did my training if you had a hysterectomy when i was doing my training you were in hospital for seven days you know and you weren't allowed to do this and you weren't you can have it done and be out in a day now you know things move on from hugely and enormously my fundamental belief is that Whatever nursing might look like in the future, it will still come from basic ethos that it is about the care and the delivery of that care and the delivery of that nursing knowledge in whatever clinical specialty you work in, that will still always be there. But I would, I would love to see a profession that has more men in it. I'd love to see more men as midwives. Um, because I think that the profession of nursing should reflect society. You know, why is it that a male nurse always assumes, everybody assumes that they must be a doctor or why, and they're, they're often questioned, why didn't you become a doctor? Well, actually because I wanted to be a nurse. And I've worked with some brilliant, brilliant nurses from all ages, all cultures, all specialties. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay. It's been great to have you on The Voice of Nursing. Um, thank you to all our nurses, doctors, allied healthcare professionals for looking after us all. Uh, we look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you.